Welcome to Conversations with Karalia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Karalia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Conversations with Karalia. Today on the show, I am interviewing Lara Charlotte. Lara Charlotte is, oh my goodness, how do I describe her? She has a tagline on Instagram. She's a mythic muse on Instagram. And her tagline there is plants, planets, and prayers. I think that kind of sums it up. Plants, because she has spent the last five years in full-time training with the traditional shamanic plant medicines in the Amazon. So that's part of what she's immersing in. She moves between Aotearoa and the Amazon, doing her training, co-facilitating, working with plant ceremonies, going deep. And then planets, because she also goes deep into astrology. And prayers, because she has that, that devotional orientation to reality, that recognition that everything is of the divine. And I first met Lara when she attended a uh, direct realization training that I led down in Wanaka, uh, maybe in 2021. It wasn't 2021. And it was so beautiful having her in the space. Like she was attending as a participant. I could really feel her ability to hold space and just the questions she asked, the way she showed up, what she brought. I was like, this is a woman I want to get to know better. And so we have become friends over the last few years. Uh, her and I were talking about all the things, as you do, particularly, you know, the sense that the old ways, the old systems no longer serve our communities and, and our land and, our, and all the animals and all the plants and us, you know, and that things need to shift, things need to change. In fact, they already are. It's already happening. It, you know, it's inevitable that we will live in a very different way. And so we were discussing this, and one of the things that Lara brought up was the fact that Pluto is about to shift or is shifting, because it kind of goes back and forth for a period of time, it's shifting from Capricorn into Aquarius. So on this conversation with Carolia, I know that we're going to dive into astrology, which isn't like one of the, the topics of the show, but we're going to be weaving it around spirituality and power and no doubt sexuality and of course, awakening. So a few other things about Lara, um, she descends from settler colonizers of mostly English, Irish, and Scottish lineage, and she was in the corporate world until about 2012 when she left due to a personal health crisis, and I love how she phrases this, she's like, I've since immersed in a journey of soul remembrance, transformational healing, and devotional service. I can so relate to that. As I mentioned, she's been spending time in the Amazon. She is also trained um, to be trauma-informed and to hold space for others. Uh, oh, there's so many things I could say about it. What else am I going to add? She is a devoted lover of the mythic realms. Now, these mythic realms, we're going to definitely talk about that. And the way that we can access and discover the mythic realms by going deep into relationship with ourself, our body, nature and story across time and space. Alrighty, so let's hear what Lara has to share with us. And as always, stick around to the very end where I'll reflect a little on our conversation. Lara, welcome to Conversations with Karalia. Shoulder, hello. Ah, where in the world are you right now? I am in Brisbane as of Friday. And I will be here for six weeks-ish uh, before heading to Bali. Oh, warmth. It's going to be so much warmer than New Zealand right now because were you just back in the South Island in Dunedin? Yeah, so I came back to New Zealand for two weeks oh. after being in Peru for two and a half months. So it's just like a blast of cold. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, then I slipped off to Brisbane, yeah. Oh, bless. 
Oh, so I've started to ask all my guests this question to, to begin with and like feel free to answer through any way that you wish. What's your worldview? Like how do you perceive reality, this dance that we're all in? How do I perceive reality? Pretty multidimensionally a lot of the time. <laughs> um, and to put a, a worldview, like a name to it, I'd say I'm an animist, 100%. My experience is that not only humans are people, but that this reality that I live in is populated by many different types of people, both mm. seen and unseen. So, um, yeah, that's that's really at the core, I think, of how I experience reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you say that, do you mean like rock people, tree people, spirit people, ghost people, like all of the different beings? Yeah. Yeah. Ancestor people, story people, mm. maybe even frequency, frequencies of archetypal information that can be mm. related with as people. Yeah, as is, I have a pretty highly relational um, worldview, I guess. And yeah, it's much broader than just the humans. Mm. Or, the, or the third dimension you know yeah mm -hmm. so what brought you to that particular worldview like did you grow up in sort of standard New Zealand what is there such a thing but yeah can you give us a little bit of a snippet of like what worldview was growing up and how you ended up here in the animist worldview well when I was very small I had an imaginary imaginary friend called Kelly Ander and I really remember what she looked like and remember spending time with her and I didn't really know that she was an imaginary friend until it was brought up again in older years um I also remember being quite small maybe seven and I had this secret tree at primary school that I would go and stand under the windy tree by myself at lunchtime and if I leaned my back against the tree and I somehow knew how to do something I would lift my arms up and the wind would blow and then I would put my arms down and the wind would stop blowing and I knew that if I told anyone that would stop happening so you know I was um my mum bless her wonderful Pisces was pretty accommodating with Kellyander you know I think there was a place at the table for her a spot in the car also, knowing my personality, I would have had a huge meltdown if I didn't, you know, if there wasn't. But <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I was I was allowed to live in my imaginal state when I was young, which was probably pretty beneficial. And then, um, you know, yeah, I went to went to a public school, did my thing, had a pretty mixed childhood of both adverse and supportive experiences. And then um it had a corporate career things got pretty pretty narrow for a while I think I was just interested in finding my place in society mm -hmm. and in 2015 I mean in 2012 I had a huge kind of shift in consciousness that happened through kind of sickness actually and mm -hmm. I was very much at that crossroads of am I mentally ill am I going crazy or is something else happen? And it was, it was an initiatory experience, which I was lucky enough to lean into and be received by some people that were more masterful with the types of experiences I was having. And so from 2012 until 2015, I was kind of in a transition period living in Melbourne, winding up my career in the arts and uh, get, starting to study astrology, starting to, I did my Reiki trainings, level one and two, and just actually taking some steps into the wisdom traditions that could hold this multidimensional experience I was having. And then in 2015, I left Australia uh, to go traveling and ended up in South America. Mm. Pretty much just looking for a new something like a new something and piece by piece synchronicities flow you know probably the soul's impulse for evolution uh led me to Peru and uh again through a series of coincidences I found myself 
um, at a fledgling retreat center working with traditional plant medicines in the Amazon, working with traditional shamanic healers and rituals and ceremonies working with psychedelic plants. Mm -hmm. So then things were getting, you know, not only was I having my experience, but I found myself landed within a lineage that had a full context mm. for me to start developing, exploring and, and healing from that animist perspective. Um, mm -hmm. It was no longer just me having the experience or a couple of people that could help me with my experience. I stepped into um, a field, a living field of, of wisdom with all the other beings. So it wasn't mm. just me anymore. It was like, okay, now, now you're joining the party, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. How did it feel when you were like, oh, it's not just about me. Now I'm joining the party. What's the feeling? Do you remember? Overwhelming relief. Hmm. A huge, huge release of creative energy. I've hmm. never, I can't think of a time in my life where I had so much energy to just do the things that needed to be done. You know, an incredible sense of purpose and a total falling away of neurosis and anxiety around what am I doing? What do I want? What are my goals? What's my path? What's my mission? Um, what's next? The kind of uh, the the will driven desire for drive, being at the steering wheel of my own life and always being in self improvement and always moving to the next thing that just kind of dropped away, and I plugged into a current of creative energy that was able to, that I was able to collaborate with and, and contribute to and serve through and with. But it was no longer just about me making all the decisions. Mm -hmm. Did it feel a little scary? Did you feel like you were losing control as such? Yeah, there were there were moments. So, in the tradition that I studied in, you know, lots of people have heard about ayahuasca. It's quite common. People might understand about doing ayahuasca ceremonies. Perhaps they understand about psychedelic therapy. In a psycholo you know, in psychology, it's an emerging mm -hmm. field. In the tradition that I studied in, although ayahuasca ceremonies are part of the whole system of healing, what's actually more at the core of it is going into periods of devotional um, communion mm. with plant spirits. And that means removing oneself from daily life, you know talking to other people you're often a little hut by yourself removing stimulating foods removing salt from the diet not talking not making eye contact with others not touching others you know this is at the most sort of strict level and perhaps you know drinking the body of the plant that you're getting to know so drinking a medicine made from that plant but more to the point focusing on talking to creating space inside yourself to receive relationship with that plant mm. and then revelation and communication and shifts in consciousness and how you feel might start to reveal themselves through dreams through songs through just the general it's almost like I'm now looking at the world through the eyes of the plant yeah that I'm in communion with and as I did more of those processes, these are called master plant dieters, and I created more deep relationships with different master plants, they become allies. They, I become in an intimate relationship with them. So what they want to do or what they would like to be happening or how they would like me to collaborate with them did start to really influence the direction of my life. And I had a period of time where I was like, oh my God, the plants have hijacked my life. Like the plant, you know, <laughs> where I got fearful and I got scared and I was like, fuck, what have I done? Like, and that was 100% part of, um, part of the journey. Yeah. Mm. And those, those plants that you're entering into deep communion with aren't necessarily always like psychedelic plants, are they? Like you did, am I correct in you worked with the rose? That was one of the plants that you worked with? Yeah. So, um, 
the plants, the, the plantas maestras, the master plants, the teacher plants, there's so many of them in the Amazon and really they are healing plants for healing different often conditions or teaching us certain things or helping us cultivate certain abilities. Perhaps they support us to have spiritual and energetic protection in our life. Um, there's a real there's a real collaboration and most of them aren't psychedelic yeah. at all. Um, but in saying that, there's still a multi-dimensional experience of relating with them once the sensitivity opens up. Yeah. And I realize like I'm in communication with um, let's say the rose in and through my body and my own experiences, I'm having a communication and a communion. Mm -hmm. But the rose, the rose actually wasn't part of that tradition. The rose was something that I took upon myself to start working with because I realized that my blood ancestors and my DNA, the, the blood and bone that I've got here now, didn't recognize a lot of the plants I was working with. Ah, because you don't fuck a papa to South America as such. Not at all. Yeah. And I really, um, I was going through a breakup. I was actually leaving that retreat center that I'd built. I was facing a huge initiation of loss and I needed all the support I could get. And I felt like I was stranded out in this ocean of new plants. And maybe my soul has mm. knowledge of other timelines and stuff, you know, but in terms of this, this vessel, I, I felt yeah, the rose just started showing up. The mm. rose was showing up and I thought, oh my gosh, of course, because all my ancestors would know what a rose is, you know? Yeah. So you're talking going back to the Celtic, the Irish, the English, like those lineage, Celtic? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have some Irish blood. Um, and yeah, my my lineage is mostly, as far as I know, English, Irish, Scottish, yeah. bit of Scandinavian, bit of French. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. So juicy. What I'm picking up from what you're saying is that it's one thing to go and do like a plant medicine ceremony, et cetera, where you might ingest a plant and have an experience. It's another thing to come into communion deeply with the plant that you might be ingesting. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, you know, one of the things that can happen when we take a part of a tradition that appeals to us or has yeah whatever out of its traditional context and relocate it is that often something's lost yeah or often something's changed and because western culture or my culture of origin anyway is very psychological and very like centered in the experience of the individual mm. when we take something like an ayahuasca ceremony and we plonk it in Auckland and yet people are like you know it's not that people aren't having amazing experiences I'm mm -hmm. sure they are it's just there's a much broader experience of reality yeah. that that kind of work originates from that decenters the self mm. it centers the self it's animistic and you're not necessarily in that ceremony to help yourself like get the dream lover get the dream job have the great health so you can have more personal power so you can fulfill your potential and me 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 my dad calls it the screaming memes <laughs> it's like she's got a bad case of the screaming memes you know um and i'm not saying that it's a bad thing but i'm saying that the deeper you go the subtleties of working with power and plants and these traditions it's like you build you know Jenga that game Jenga uh-huh put a couple of blocks on the bottom and you're a bit off center it's not really an issue but what the higher that tower gets yeah the, that that off centeredness when the power builds and the further you go it will topple at some point mm. ah that's a great analogy yeah yeah, that piece feels really important. Um, I know, like, as you're aware, I'm taking a sabbatical from, from teaching right now. 
And one of the things that I've been really exploring or, or feeling into is unhooking personal identity or achievement from the role of teacher, recognizing where my own patterns or conditionings, like what you're saying, might be informing how I was showing up as a teacher. And as a part of that, also recognizing that I'm, I'm starting to get a sense of like, if I'm really teaching this stuff, it's not really about the personal attainment or like for the students you know there's a real like you say an emphasis when students come to work with me they want to feel better land the right job you know all of those different things it's like actually what if it's broader what if the context is different what if we're practicing out of love for the goddess or out of love for our communities what if every time we practice where it's like an offering that we're making so it's really interesting hearing you exploring that same sort of territory and it makes me wonder, is it just a stage that we're going through where the Western me individual centric stuff will shift that we have to go through this stage or are we stuck in it and we desperately need to shift how we perceive ourselves in reality in order to move out of the me centric perspective? That's a big question. <laughs> I mean, on a purely like physical level, I think that the human population has spiked so massively since the Industrial Revolution. There are more of us on the planet than there have been in the last 10,000 years. And the impact of that on our physical world is pretty, you know, I don't care if you believe in climate change or not, or not you or anyone listening. Yeah. That's not the point. The basic reality is that the load of the human species on the planet is bigger than it's been in 10,000 years and it has consequences yeah. and those consequences are directly related to us doing things in a way where we it's like I end here and then that begins there mm. you know a, a, a real distinct lack of understanding around interbeing yeah yeah into being I love that okay so here's the question I know like as I practice and do all of this that there starts to be less and less of a sense of a fixed identity or a separate self it's just way more fluid and I notice like when I'm around people it's it's like I feel them bleeding into me and it's just like do you notice that do you know what I'm what I'm sort of referencing? It's like we are yeah. not separate individuals. There is something else going on here that we have not, well, some of us have not yet woken up to. There are some traditions that are well aware of it. Yeah, what's your experience of that? Yeah, it exists on so many layers. I mean, I have Neptune on my ascendant. So Neptune dissolves boundaries and the ascendant is kind of like the barrier of the self, like between the self and the world. So, you know, if I spend a lot of time with someone, <laughs> I might jump into the shower that night and close my eyes and I just feel like I'm them. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know. I do and, know. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of different stuff going on. Um, like, what if every, you know, it's hard because when I talk about multidimensionality, we really are moving through different layers. Like, on a nervous system level, you know, we're tuning with each other and drawing each other into different nervous system states. Mm -hmm. On a psychological level, there's these psychological things that are playing out. Mm -hmm. On a energetic and auric level, you know, things emerging. And then like on a on a spirit level, which some people don't even believe in, we start moving more and more towards this oneness. Yeah, And so I think whatever the practices or whatever the context is or whatever the decision that's been made is, to be whole, to be fully expressed, to be fully plugged in to a current of something that's happening beyond just like what I think is a good idea, mm -hmm. we need to have ways to shift gears like up and down between these different levels or in and out between these different levels and orient you know, mm. for the for the situation, for what's appropriate. So we've got a highly cultivated psychological relational model. We've got a highly cultivated 
physical relational model. I don't think we have a highly cultivated spiritual relational model mm. present mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm definitely getting really interested in, particularly in the heart space. Um, Because you've done Uchada with me, you're aware of Uchada practice and how it's quite deeply centered in the heart. For those of you who aren't aware, it's a a tantric practice that I was taught by Christopher Tompkins. And, you know, there's research coming through now around the way that this heart resonance, the way that like energetic, is it energetically? No, I I don't think it's even energetic. So I'm not even sure how to describe it. I just know the scientific research coming through around the way. Yeah, electrically that the hearts connect what's your understanding of that through the astrological lens, but also through the ceremonial lens or devotional lens? Mm. Resting in the heart, resting Mm. awareness in the heart is always a theme that keeps coming back um, through all the different practices that I've been drawn to. And there's something around core vitality like what does it even mean to be alive Hmm. well what is the meaning of life while life is vitality it's aliveness Hmm. it's 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 that essence that spark that's moving that that presence of something and actually through embodiment practices and and for me plant medicines like very somatic so when I do my master plant theatres or I work with the ayahuasca a lot of the conversations happening through the sensations that arise in my body Mm -hmm. and the heart you know the more I work with the heart the more I realize that it's just this infinite space it's just like Uh People talk about going into the womb and I've done a lot of womb work. The rose really taught me a lot about the womb um, being kind of like a mm, like a black hole that everything comes from and goes back to like a really multi-dimensional creative portal in the body. And the heart also for me is a gateway into just infinite space and vitality. And mm-hmm. that shows up in astrology through our relationship to the sun. Mm. The sun, which is at the center of our solar system, radiates all the light that gives life. And the sun is the ruler of the sign Leo. And the sign Leo rules over the heart. Um, yeah, that's something that, and then the Uchada practice, my time with that, it was like coming back into the heart. My time with the Hridaya yoga tradition, the meditation of the heart and it just what if the intelligence of the heart was able to give us answers and guide us in ways that the mind cannot you know Mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm aware that as we're speaking of this that some people listening or watching often think about perceptual reality and so for some people who are not yet embodied the idea of being able to even sense or feel resting in the heart or resting in the womb. It's like, what are you talking about? That's not a real thing. Um, And so I just want to kind of name that, that as perceptual beings, we have a range of perception. And what I've noticed with practice and ceremony is that my range of perception continues to expand. So things like I was incredibly shut down in my teen, teen years. So things, I didn't even perceive them. So it seemed as if they weren't real or weren't true. But then as my perceptual ability started to expand, it's like, oh, that's there. And it was always there. I just couldn't perceive it. Uh, So what would you say to someone who might not yet be embodied and might be like, what do you mean resting in the infinite spaciousness of the heart? How do I access that? Hmm. I would say right now in this very moment to place your hand on your chest and say me me mine as soon as we touch the heart and we say that me we don't touch our forehead we don't say me or mine we say me Mm. and to shift the attention of the mind Mm -hmm. shifting it even to the hand even if the interior of the body feels a bit strange but just to pay attention 
to the way that the hand feels resting on the chest. Mm. And then perhaps even to notice the breath moving the hand up and down. Mm. And even just a few moments of that, it's yeah. like, I feel different. The mood's changed. The atmosphere's changed. Mm -hmm. Maybe I felt resistance. Maybe I was like, oh, I want to cry. Or, oh, I don't like that. Or, you know, whatever. But it's this just this literal turning of attention towards things. That's why the dietas um, require us to remove ourselves from daily life, to remove ourselves from, you know, the kitchen and the talking and the salt and the distractions. It's like, Use that mind that we've got these big oversized human brains. <laughs> Use them to turn our attention towards something. And then that something can open up. Mm, I love that. Like right there, if someone was to take that on as a daily practice, even if you're just doing it two minutes a day, that is going to start to have a real measurable impact. I love how practical and how direct it is. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Oh. Now I know that obviously we're we're in mid July recording this mid July twenty twenty three or tenth of July, and Venus is about to, is it about to enter Leo. Is that correct? What's happening? She's there now. She's already there. Okay, so let's talk about this cycle of Venus and Leo and how Venus is about to kind of disappear because she alternates, doesn't she? The evening star between the being the morning star and the evening star what's going on in the sky and how does it relate to our heart experience of reality yeah oh so massive so i actually noticed that you're wearing a five-pointed star which is uh -huh. a symbol of Venus. that's the shape that she makes in the sky over her eight years over an eight-year cycle i was like oh, oh my goodness Venus star right there i didn't know that and you know what's interesting i'm just gonna have to interject on this i wrote down on my you know to-do list a little while ago find a representation of Venus for my altar on my walls or whatever and huh. I, I, di I didn't think I had found one yet and yet I've been wearing this for about six weeks or so I, I, I was looking for a star so unconsciously without knowing I've I've been wearing my Venus symbol so thank you for pointing that out <laughs> yeah the five-pointed star of Venus yeah <sighs> so yeah I will just link the chat about the plants to the planets is that in my work with the plants the planets just started revealing themselves more and more and more through my dreams through my visions through synchronicity through ceremony through just me suddenly becoming super obsessed with astrology um but not in this psychological you know in, in a really different way like oh my goodness i can have a relationship with the planets like i have a relationship with the plants and understanding that it all came in really with the rose with my relationship with the rose dieting with rose and it just opening up this massive connection to venus and then me following the breadcrumb trail and realizing that i am not the first person in the history of humankind to make this connection but that it's actually part of a much older wisdom tradition that weaves through a few different lines you know back for thousands and thousands of years so when I talk about astrology, I'm talking about it in that context. I'm talking about it in terms of as above, so below, as within, so without. That the, the huge planetary frequency and intelligence that is Venus and all the deities and goddesses and parts of life and all of the associations with Venus, if that's one big river, that I too am like a small stream of that river and it's got a unique current based on how I'm wired and when I was born and what my little unique constitution is, you know? So mm -hmm. when I speak of Venus, I'm speaking about it in that context, mm -hmm. not like something out there that's happening, that's making this happen to me. It's, it's, it's a two way, yeah. it's a two way thing. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can feel that when you're describing like the, the the great river of Venus as such and how we are part of that river in our own unique expression. Like, oh, she's running through us 
yeah it's a whole different way to perceive because it, it removes that separateness that duality that there that is there I am it's like ah huh. yeah you know I have this absolutely incredible teacher and he says your chart lives in your body so mm. to whatever extent you're available for in whatever moment these pl planetary influences are reflecting and what's happening now is that if you go outside after dark just after dark and look west venus is at maximum brightness she is this huge fat diamond in the sky she's so so big and she's dropping 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 and then on the 23rd of july her speed will match it'll she'll slow down to a point or, or her perceived speed from earth will make it look like she's going backwards mm -hmm. and that's when the retrograde starts she's not actually moving backwards it just looks like she is but the venus retrograde occurs when she moves um between the earth and the sun so she comes so so close to us and she passes between the earth and the sun getting as close as she ever gets to earth and during that process she will disappear for a while from the evening sky and then be reborn as the morning star mm. so it's this window of time where our bodies literally the body of the earth and us on the body of the earth come closer to the body of venus and we're also lined up with the sun which is as i said that emanating force of vitality in our solar system and all of this is happening in terms of the sun's path in the zodiac sign of leo mm. so that gives it all another flavor mm -hmm. and they are even from my perspective they are evolutionary opportunities happening within the context of a deeply related universe where planetary bodies have qualities just like plant bodies or animal bodies or human bodies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something's going down you know yeah yeah yeah. yeah yeah so if you're aware of what those qualities or attributes are then you can align or surrender or harness or you know pick your adjective and it's the same kind of way like if it snows and there's fresh powder you can put on the skis and go skiing but if there's only rocks it's probably not so wise um right a great analogy a very good yeah super practical <laughs> just like that there are things that can only be said in the context of this so there are things that can only be done in the context of this there are opportunities and moments of synergy and alchemy that can only happen within this particular relationship in this particular moment in time. Mm. And I believe that because Venus, because, you know, we've got the sun radiating all life force, then we've got Mercury. Mercury is the first planet after the sun and he's kind of like the translator. He kind of turned, is like information. He's Hermes, you know, he's the messenger. Mm. And then we've got Venus. Venus begins this process of relating. Mm -hmm. this process of relationship and the feminine current you know as, as relevant to male or female bodied people the feminine current of consciousness moving through venus and so down here on earth in terms of trying to become more available for life to move through us in a meaningful way to become more available for our own truth and authenticity and maybe to orient to a power that is uh less kind of willful and more organically arising mm -hmm. to Heal or adjust or evolve the way that our relationships are actually playing out on like a very just day-to-day -day level and everything we love and value venus you know the most prized things on this planet come under the domain of venus mm -hmm. or you could think of lakshmi you know money beauty romance um these kinds of most highly prized qualities of the human experience you know they mm -hmm. they do come under venus's domain 
but they also cause most of our grief as well. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. And a lot of that's Leo as well, isn't it? Like Leo is luxury and opulence and blessing, like all of those aspects. Okay, so if that is happening, like there's, there's this particular movement in the sky, how can people best? I almost don't want to use the word take advantage because it feels a little bit like taking and advantage. Let me see if I can rephrase it. Um, how can people best surrender to and align? Maybe that's a better way to put it. How can people surrender and align to the benefits of this particular transit that's occurring? Mm. Sure. Well, you know, we're lucky that we have like 5,000 years of astrology to draw from where mm. people have observed these movements of the planets and, and made um, wise and sincere interpretations that we can look back on. We can also look at the times in our lives where similar things have happened because Venus actually has a very easy to follow repetitive cycle. Mm -hmm. So in 2015 was the last time that Venus had this cycle she was retrograde close to the earth and she she started a 584 day cycle from the sign of leo so what was happening in 2015 and where might in these leo themes or in these venus themes with your relationships with your money with your heart with your leo self-esteem authentic creative expression pride courage you know, um, also the, the inverse of that, like shame and fear and, and not wanting to be seen. Mm -hmm. These Venus and Leo themes are coming back around to pick up where we left off. Mm. It would be as simple as old lovers coming back mm -hmm. or the same type of lover coming back, but in a, a different body. Um, for me, I realized that in 2015, I met my now ex-husband and then in 2019 when venus lined up with the sun but on the far side of the earth which was kind of like a midpoint in the cycle we broke up and huh. now we're getting a divorce finally wow so that's just like a very easy one to notice mm -hmm. but what's the deeper current what's the deeper question yeah the deeper question is like i can look at my chart and in my particular, and this is where the unique personal blueprint comes into it. This is where we, we've we got this wisdom tradition of astrology that's so much deeper than the horoscope in the magazine Yeah, that can help us to look at our own individual chart and see specifically where the invitation is and receive guidance about how to masterfully work with that energy. Uh -huh. So yeah. in my case, Leo is my eighth house and the eighth house is all about sex death transformation other people's money enemies um it's 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 all the traditional scorpionic stuff and you know bringing that quality through this story that i can see playing out it's like well yeah what is what is my relationship to that where did my lack of self-esteem or my pride or my inability to really feel my own essence lead me astray mm. in, in my romantic life because Venus was was part of that. Mm -hmm. So during this 40 days and 40 nights of the Venus retrograde from July 22nd until September 3rd, we're in this like alchemical furnace of Venus passing between the earth and the sun and receiving the seeds and the imprints and the invitations to expand, grow, come into more wholeness, I would say, ultimately, because uh -huh. the feminine for me is like wholeness. When she then emerges as a morning star, it's like out the starting gates. We Let's go. go. Yeah. Yeah. And she will rise in the morning, morning as a morning star doo -doo 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 -doo, just before dawn. And then she'll get to the far side of the earth and she'll disappear again. And then that's a another opportunity to shed, decompose, mature, compost, refine the whole subject. And then she'll emerge as an evening star. And suddenly it's like, okay, we've taken these themes 
now can we integrate them not just in the personal self but in my gift to the collective as well and it becomes this integrated feminine that's giving and receiving in equal measure mm, ah, so we're yeah. on the precipice of a massive big journey that's about to start so I would suggest that people really pay attention to those 40 days and 40 nights at, of the retrograde because that's where you're getting given the assignment you're getting shown like this is the subject this is the material uh-huh and then it will roll for like another 594 days in the cycle mm -hmm. yeah that's right oh that's juicy that's enough juicy. Time, like enough time to have two babies <laughs> <laughs> well if you're moving fast um okay so when when you're like looking at astrology like this how does it impact how you see society as a whole like it does feel like Feel, I mean, to me, when I look out, it feels like everything is kind of collapsed, not collapsing, but that things need to shift on a larger scale. Like here in Aotearoa, you know, the level of homelessness, of housing insecurity, disparity of wealth. It, it seems like all of these things are increasing. And I'm like, what? how we're orientating society doesn't really seem to be beneficial for not just humans, but animals and the land, et cetera. So when you're looking at astrology, do you apply it to the broader social context? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And some of my favorite astrologers are really amazing at tracking the news and tracking, you know, tick, 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 things that are happening and being like, boom, 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 boom. From my perspective, the most important, like as I was talking about um, the sun being at the center and then Mercury and then Venus and then Mars, I would say that Mercury, Venus and Mars are like personal planets. They tend mm -hmm. to relate a lot more to our individual internal growth then we've got jupiter and saturn which you could call social planets so looking at the movements of jupiter and saturn informs a lot about the greater social cycles that are happening and the changes that are happening and what where the solutions and where the guidance lies is that every zodiac sign for example and every planet has a spectrum of expressions from kind of distorted or shadowy to really exalted and integrated. Mm. So when I'm noticing things happening in the world and I'm noticing those social planets, Jupiter and Saturn, and then beyond Jupiter and, Jupiter and Saturn, the transpersonal planets, the change gods, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. Mm -hmm. That's the big karmic evolutionary huge stuff that's where our soul gets woke even if we fucking hate it because it's so intense or where society does a total like makeover do over kind of thing you know so when I look at there's a couple of big cycles to look at right now which feel truly relevant and feel that they offer from my perspective a lot of guidance um one of them and it's just so cool because it's all geometry and patterns. And if you have ever worked with psychedelics, um, you know, we know that like mathematics are encoding the fabric of reality. These are amazing yeah. geometric designs, you know. Mm -hmm. So the planets are all cool with that too. <laughs> <laughs> Saturn and Jupiter will meet every 20 years. They meet in a sign of the same element and they'll do that for 200 years and then they'll switch elements so we've just completed 200 years of earth sign meetings uh -huh. remembering jupiter and saturn social planets they govern our laws our boundaries our philosophies our kind of like the social trends and perspective of the collective on the in the southern hemisphere on the summer solstice so like december 21st 2020 they met for the first time in an air sign they started a new air sign cycle mm -hmm. and they started it at zero degrees of aquarius uh -huh. the solstice has nothing to do with the pattern um being at zero degrees aquarius has nothing to do with the pattern but both of those things add extra sort of gravitas and extra potency to that zero degrees the seed the absolute earliest like the seed of the aquarian thing was where they met 
Mm. What that tells me, and then they'll meet in Gemini, and then they'll meet in Libra, and then they'll meet in Aquarius, and they'll do that for 200 years. Mm -hmm. So we are moving into a air, a, 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 an air cycle. Mm -hmm. And what is air all about? Mm. Ideas, technology, philosophies, um, information as collateral and a resource rather than like property, food, mining, you know, the stuff, the earth, the, the 200 years of earth was really like a lot of development, a lot of physical yeah. development. Extraction, now, right? Mining, oil, gas, all of that stuff being literally brought up out of the earth. Yeah. And property, property, yeah. the ownership of property being the main kind of source of wealth for people in general. Yeah. Because just to remind people, like individuals owning property is, is not the only way to organize. It's not, and it's probably not the most beneficial way for communities to organize. Um, but it, yeah, it's been very prevalent in the last 200 years, particularly in Western culture. Okay. So we're moving into air. Continue on. Yeah. Um, or personal property, right? Like individual yeah. property. So there might be, um, territories of stewardship or tribal territories which is much more common where like this group of people who all belongs together all owned this area of space as their territory now it's become even more contracted down to like individuals little parcels yeah when we look at Aquarius like there's a couple of reasons that Aquarius is really interesting and this all links back to Venus as well and why this mm -hmm. Venus retrograde is so fucking cool and important and useful actually um Aquarius is all about community it's all about people power it's all about altruism and the collective it's about groups of people now at a really exalted and amazing and integrated level that would be things like humanitarianism and um really interesting kind of social justice and everybody having the freedom to be who they need to be so everyone's taken care of you know this kind of stuff it's also really related to tech and ideas and and like science fictioning new 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 what's the new solution what's the new technology on a less exalted spectrum end of the spectrum from my perspective we're talking group think oh, we're wow. talking surveillance we're talking Everybody has to do the same to be the same because that's the only way that it's fair. Or everybody getting on a bandwagon, mm -hmm. you know? Um, my dad has some good jokes about bandwagons too. It's like, you know, and, and we've, we're already seeing it. Like group think and this intensified polarization where politically in the world, people are getting really concerned with like, well, I want everything to be good for everybody and, and these real polarized mm, yeah. Just people jumping on bandwagons more and more. Mm. The other thing about Aquarius is that it says, what's everyone doing over here? But it's also kind of highly individual in the sense that it, it loves the genius. It loves the individual genius. It loves the mind that can come up with the solutions because the collective is made up of many individuals, right? That's the only way it works. So the systems that are emerging socially in this Aquarian era, while they take into account collective needs, they can kind of abdicate personal responsibility. Mm. And can you give an example of what you mean by that? Um, well, people talk about nanny states, nanny states, mm -hmm. don't they? If there's lots of rules and they're enforced by the robots and we've got some kind of freaky tech dystopia and everybody does the same thing, then everybody will be safe. Yeah. That vibe. Right. Rather than just okay. radical self-responsibility for shit. Or I mean, if, if, I, if I'm walking down the street and I see litter and we're in a nanny state, I'm like, who littered and how dare they and call the person, you know, call the council to get them to pick it up and righty run. And succeed. Or I could just pick it up and put it in the bin myself. And you would and you would maybe only do that if you actually in your heart, in your felt experience, truly felt and had an experience that what you did was plugged in and connected to everyone else. You know, it's like only from actually being centered in our own essence, which is Leo on the which is opposite Aquarius, mm -hmm. only through being plugged into that personal authentic essence can we actually show up 
to contribute to the collective in a meaningful and creative and authentic way. If we're not plugged into our own essence, the collective can only operate by being dominated and being told what to do. And everyone has to be the same. There's no room for creativity. There's no room for diversity. There's no room for like personal expression because you've just got a whole bunch of people that are like little ants that are all doing the yeah. same thing. I think this is a critical point that you're making here. So I just want to pause and like almost draw this out. What I'm hearing you say is that for epic empowered collective to really work, we all need to be centered in our own essence and our own power and our own expression. When that is happening, then amazing collective things can unfold. That's what I'm taking from it. 100% because the deeper we go into truly experiencing in an embodied way our creative essence Uh uh-huh the more we tap in to the direct experience of interbeing yes and we are connected to everything else so we're not operating from this place of like the screaming memes uh-huh we've actually got the availability within ourselves to relate from our center yeah So when you say that, what I sense and feel and have direct experience of is that that when you have the courage to go deep, which means you have to feel all the feels and all the hidden things, you know, the courage to go deep, to me, what it feels like is, is like dropping through a layer and suddenly discovering the one layer that's down there where everything is into being and all connected and having access to that whilst at the same time having this really strong epic sense of who one is here to express and to be but knowing that that's not the whole of what's occurring that's what I feel it gets me really freaking excited I gotta say the idea that lots of people may start and are starting to have that direct experience of radical expression and into being uh, underlying unity of it all I mean, you just articulated the exalted expression of the Aquarius Leo axis. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> it's an axis, you know? It's yeah. like yang, the whole zodiac, the, 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 the planetary, sorry, the, the sign oppositions work in this way. They, yeah. they fit each other, you know? And so not only are we entering an Aquarian flavored era through the Jupiter Saturn conjunction, we also have Pluto, the furthest planet in our solar system. So far away, they say he isn't even a planet. Got demoted. A... <laughs> Which is just so, so, like, it's so, it really reveals how how we relate to all of the things that Pluto transmits and, and, and represents because he is power raw power transformative power the underworld the ability to destroy so that something can regenerate the deepest shadow work the deepest confrontation of the poison and the venom and the unhealed trauma and the sticky dark shit that gets pushed way down um and Pluto Mm. will bring it up and reveal it and and, you know, one of three thing, things generally happen. People either get, like, super overwhelmed and numb out and just, like, ignore it. Mm-hmm. Somehow they try and run away from it. Or they suppress it more and more and more and then get sick or have addictions or, you know, whatever. Or they find masterful ways to go there and to do yeah. the shadow work and do the Pluto work, you know, and do the transformation, which is what you, like, your body of work is, is a really masterful tool for that, as is ayahuasca, actually yeah <laughs> it's done right you know, like all things um but pluto is also moving into aquarius for 20 years ah so bringing all of that transformational power that call for us to face our shadows all of that's coming into aquarius at the same time so when pluto popped into aquarius um just for about six weeks boom, chat GPT is released. Boom, there's going to be Robocop robots in um, San Francisco, like tech dystopia, all the fear that we have. Oh my God, there's, you know, also um, a lot of the stuff that happened with the pandemic was very much demonstrating this this Pluto leaving Capricorn and moving into Aquarius and the back and forwards of those themes. Um, 
and it's scary and we get faced with the fear because we get faced with where our relationship with power Mm -hmm. is not mature enough in this new area of Aquarius so power over instead of power in yeah let's just define that a little because obviously one of the major themes for this podcast is is power so I'm always curious to to ask people yeah how do you see power how do you define it and speak more to that idea of the difference between power over or power from within I feel like speaking about this as the way that it lives in my body um because because my son is at the very end of Capricorn and so Pluto is like on my son on and off my son non-stop for a few years power over um for me it feels like contracting contracting somehow um uh, either gripping around something either closing my fists or drawing in and away from other expressions of life be it people be it ideas whatever a contraction and then and then like a pushing I feel like I'm almost going mm, like it's and, and so that might be the way that I relate to life where I'm kind of like tensing up and drawing in and isolating and separating myself more from other people other ideas I don't know, like an isolation mm-hmm. and then a sense of um, overpowering or pushing yeah. or t- trying to impose upon while yeah. staying in separation. Uh-huh. When you describe that, I get a sense of the way that energy or power is almost generated by the contraction, the separation, the pulling away, the, the compression, and then, like you say, the imposition on another it's like oh (laughs) and whole institutions can do this whole countries can do this whole philosophies can do this whole empires can do this you know it's not just individual people Mm. Um, so that's the Capricorn era like Pluto's been in Capricorn since uh 2008 when we had the global financial crisis kicks things off it's like what is more of a power over system than the banking system hierarchical hierarchical systems that are reinforced by the law and the government which is very capricorn capricorn loves like hierarchies systems structures government laws and and with pluto moving through it's been showing the way like this system is built on a corruption of power there's a yeah. few, there's a, it's not, you know, um, it's predatory. It yeah. has a dominated thing. It's punitive. It keeps people on their knees so that it can keep functioning and ultimately benefit the most. Mm. Power over. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so as we get to the end of Pluto in, a, in Capricorn, what do we see? Banks collapsing, um, just you know the us is just so bankrupt the inflationary cycles are just going and going and going and it's just a ticking time bomb um the fiat system in general was just kind of fucked and everybody's starting to see it and then what's happening is people are starting to reveal things like decentralization um cryptocurrencies but are they just going to be the banks sorry the governments creating their own digital currencies and trying to hold that power or is there going to be these other opportunities that are arising for us to shift our relationship because Pluto has so much to do with wealth actually everything that comes out from the ground money Mm. power in that crossover between Pluto and Capricorn and Pluto and Aquarius we're in this weird bridge we're in this weird bridge between Mm. two years but by November next year, November 2024, Pluto will move back into Aquarius and move direct for 20 years. So right. then we're going to be on the train with new technology that influences the collective coming mm-hmm. out at a speed that we probably will be scared by. Our relationship with power will be questioned and all these Aquarian themes are just going to be up in everyone's faces in ways that we cannot ignore. Mm. Okay, so I want to come back to a couple of the things you mentioned there. But first, we talked about power over. How would you describe power from 
within resting in power standing and like you know how does that feel for me in the body that feels like a my central channel it feels I immediately my awareness immediately moves to the column that runs from the base of my spine to the crown of my head and I notice that the edges of my physical body feel softer Mm -hmm. I feel like where Lara ends and the air around me begins feels quite soft and although I feel this intensely alive vitality through the center of my being I don't feel contracted I feel quite open and spacious and very centered and and my heart is coming into awareness as well Mm -hmm. and I notice that if I needed to that I think from that place I feel action arising. I feel action arising up and through me, mm. through an openness and through being plugged into something that is infinitely renewable. That central channel that I'm feeling, it has it, there's it only just goes. It's like an infinitely renewable source of energy. It doesn't have. I don't have to like make it do, be there. It's just always there. Mm. and so from that place I don't really feel any sense of um being particularly intimidated or like I'm going to run out of resources or like I have to grasp at anything because like I say it's infinitely regenerative Mm. Mm. that's what power in feels like to me I love that so power from within it's infinitely regenerative it's like just tapping into that source and there's a softness but also You didn't use this word, but what I feel is like a resoluteness, like a here I am. Yeah. And there's a lot, you know, as you would know from your own practice, when we start going into that central channel, there's a lot of shit in there, right? So it can be scary. Um, There can be stuff we don't want to look at. There can be stuff that feels overwhelming. And Pluto, you know, when you have a Pluto transit in your chart, Hmm. (laughs) <laughs> whatever or wherever Pluto's hitting the collective, we will be required to face those themes as we would face dealing with our own darkest shadows. Yeah. And so the personal practice that empowers us to do that and teaches us how to do that from different wisdom traditions, astrology, tantra, plant medicine, whatever it is, of course that's going to make us better prepared to face that society societally you know yeah yeah I do that's what it feels I almost feel like I've been through this huge initiation and particularly the last three or four years like right since COVID right the very first direct realization tantra training that I ran started I think January 12th 2020 and it was like literally right on this major astrological event and I feel like I've been trained in how to increase my capacity my willingness my desire and my capability of meeting the deepest darkness within myself and then within others so that I can then meet it within society and I feel like the more of us that have this ability then the more capacity we have as a collective to hold whatever does flush out over the next 10, 20, without being afraid, being able to hold it, being able to say, we can handle the dark, we can handle the shadow. We ain't got no fear of that shit. You know, bring it if you have to. <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, that January 2020, that was when Pluto and Saturn met in Capricorn and basically the pandemic went boom, you know? And yeah. you listen if you listen back to old astrology podcasts from like the years leading up to that, it was literally predicted and talked about, you know? Yeah. And I think what you're saying is that, yeah, not only with a fearlessness, but that fearlessness comes not from being like, I can, I'm tough. I can take anything. It's from a deep understanding of impermanence. Yeah. um, Yeah. Dealing with the fear of death, dealing with all of these things and then creating space for joy, creativity, pleasure, um, because like we can be scared of joy if we're scared of 
if, if we are scared, scared of impermanence and endings, we will also be scared of joy and pleasure and creating. Why? Because it's going to finish. It's going to go away. It won't last forever. We will have to experience loss. And so this again is this, this Leo dynamism, the heart, the pleasure, the authentic creativity. Like what is your, like where does your joy come from? Well, it comes from uniquely being who you are and you can only be that if you're not too scared to experience it and lose it. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, facing the fear of impermanence, facing the fear of death. And, and once the fear of death has been faced into, what else is there, really? Or well, the fear of fear itself, you know? Mm. So just to pull out one of the aspects that you mentioned in terms of the the shift as Pluto, it goes back and forth because it's going retrograde a few times, moves from Capricorn to Aquarius. You're talking about technology, right? And often when we think about technology, we're thinking about cell phones and AI and all of those things. I also perceive technology as in how I work with the psyche, how I work with consciousness, how I work in the subtle realms. And over the last three or four years, I feel like, again, I've been given this deep dive into really deeply understanding the technology of Tantra and starting to see the underlying principles of what makes the practices work and function, which is then making me go, okay, if I understand the principles of these practices and da, 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 can I actually generate, create my own technology to work in the subtle realms to share with people? So what I'm curious about is, can technology refer to working with consciousness? Can it refer to working with psychology? Is it? Can it be the practices that we use as such, the tools that we generate? Is it rather than just electronic or that kind of technology? Definitely. And I love that you took it there because I haven't taken it there recently, but 100% yes. Mm. Um, I think exalted Aquarius, we will also be seeing things like more um, frequency medicine, yeah. more understanding around like, yeah, like light and sound healing, things like that. And, you know, I've said as well, the data, the technology of data, I've said that before. So 100%, yeah, these masterful systems, right? Because Aquarius is actually ruled by Saturn. And so ah. is Capricorn. So you've got two signs side by side that are both ruled by Saturn but in kind of different ways. Saturn loves a system and loves a structure. In Capricorn, it's a very physical, it's related to the 3D and the element of earth. In Aquarius, it's related to fixed air. So like mm. course, concepts, structures, you know, like the Uchada practice, it's a structure that you're putting in to your energy body over and over again through frequency, through yeah. visualization, through sound. And in a very similar way, the technology of dieta, the master plant dietas um, in the Amazon, you know, the maestros and maestras that I've learned from, when they sing and when they work with people, they're putting in these like light and sound and frequency structures into the energy body that hold the relationship with the plants in a particular way for a particular purpose. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if during this next 20 years we see more marrying of science and esotericism yeah yeah it's like science is finally going to begin to catch up um i've just been listening to a podcast with aubrey marcus where he's talking to some dude sorry some dude i can't remember your name but he's talking about magic and they're actually talking about the scientific double blind studies that have been done to test things like the power of intention etc cetera, etc cetera. And, you know, one of the findings that comes through time and time again is that when there is a deep belief, or you could say knowingness, that something is what it is, that, for example, that intention works. Like if you bless your food when you eat it and you absolutely believe or just know that blessing your food has a material impact, what they've discovered is that through these double blind studies, it does. It does, you know. So, I love what you're saying there. I think that it's so strange, isn't it, how we need science to validate what the wisdom traditions have known and taught for so long, but maybe that's the way it is. Um, 
how do you see what do you see happening if science and the esoteric all start to work together instead of it being an either or as such well mm -hmm. one way in which this is already manifesting is you know the maps conference just happened in colorado which was attended by thousands of people uh, talking about psychedelic therapies and Australia has just legalized psilocybin and MDMA for to be used by psychiatrists and yeah. psychotherapists. And, you know, that's kind of an example where these two worlds are coming together. Yeah. Like anything, a problem, what did Albert Einstein say? A problem oh. cannot be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. Yeah. So if somebody is suffering intense isolation, lack of purpose, um, lack of connection to their authentic self, shame, uh, depression, whatever, and then they are given a bunch of psychedelics and it's all framed within your story, your trauma, your mind, the psychiatric mm. model, which pathologizes altered states, mm -hmm. is that going to expand? Band, nourish, plug in, heal, reorganize, or is it going to drive that nail deeper? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my sense or feeling around that is that the psychedelics and MDMA, they're so potent and powerful that they have the capacity to actually break through the psychological model that might be being imposed, et cetera. Um, yeah, I think they're more powerful than the psychological model. Especially and, the plants. For me, especially yeah. the plants. Like I haven't I haven't got a deep relationship with like the spirit, the collective spirit of MDMA, for example. Yeah. But I do have a relationship with the spirit of little magic mushrooms. Yeah. And what I've learned from the teachers in the jungle is that those relationships with those spirits are absolutely essential for therapeutic outcomes mm. it can go really wrong <laughs> if you invoke if you do not if you're not clear it's 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 like I could meet a person and I could be really looking for a husband or like a partner that's going to really expand my life and I want to have this deep intimacy and it's going to be really beautiful but if I just like go out and get wasted and have a one night stand in a toilet and like bring out their absolute worst don't communicate what I want or need cross all their boundaries doesn't matter how much potential that person has to like be a really amazing partner that's carnage and it's probably not gonna lead to that you know so I, I frame it, I'm a little bit like, mm, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. Like, that's all we, can, I'm like, let's see. Let's see what yeah. happens. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I've got a friend who's doing a master's right now in psychedelic therapy and a number of people I know that are investigating this and they're already coming from the more expanded perception of reality and stuff, but they're looking to go into these realms because they want to work with people in a legal beneficial way. So, you know, I do see my sense is that the therapists that are drawn to work with these plants are probably statistically more likely to actually have models of reality that go beyond the psychiatric or the psychology, you know, the, um, the psychologist frame of reference as such. Yeah. I would hope so. I would hope that they themselves had been initiated to a level yeah. where they could help navigate those spaces. Yeah. With more direct experience. Mm, mm. Oh, so much juiciness I'm just aware of time I'm kind of looking to see oh, I know so many things so we talked about is, it, is there anything else you want to add about power anything else you want to add about power how it relates to Pluto or perhaps to Scorpio I think that ultimately all power comes from the unseen comes from mm. beyond the cognizant mind you know so thank you for holding space for my tangents that I go on with these subjects it can just be like Ooh. um we will experience the consequences of our misuse of power one way or another just yeah. like a toddler 
who's like finally learned to move their body and they just smash and hurt themselves or break things and then there's consequences as a species we are experiencing the consequences of our misuse of power and the rate at which that self corrects might involve mass um extinction it might involve a huge drop in the population it might you know involve these crazy feedback loops on the planet weather patterns whatever but ultimately you know everything's existing here now in the present moment that's where the power is so it's only from that place that we can ever start to change anything anyway so even though we zoom out and look at the macro and look at these big things and contextualize things in a really big even deep time you know even like kali yuga level of time the transformation only ever happens like in the now moment and yeah. like in a series of stacked now moments so i have another teacher the guy i did my astrology apprenticeship with and he says we don't know enough to worry <laughs> i love that because you know i feel that like i am not worried or afraid about what's unfolding i feel deeply excited because my sense is that the more beautiful world that we all know is possible is already happening and the way that things can shift so quickly like you said the power lies in the subtle realms and when things shift on the subtle realms it shows up in the material quite quickly um so i just have a sense that you know society as we know it or reality as we know it could almost like go through a doorway there could be such a sharp a fast shift in how we organize how we perceive reality as societies as governments and you know in politics and power all the things um yeah that maybe I'm an optimist or maybe that's just true <laughs> well I think you've got a nice balance of Leo and Scorpio going on there you know as, as we know it's true and yeah I I try to look at it as a creative process yeah. um that's why I take you know I take pleasure in my devotional practice I take pleasure in like the creative process even like going through hell and back I've been through some horrible experiences of trauma in my life and loss and grief and betrayal and sickness and some quite full-on stuff when I was younger too and strangely through it all I always remain curious about it I'm like oh mm. look what's happening yeah oh, this feels oh you know this is curiosity and I think that's my North Star anyway, is my creative yeah. curiosity. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, because it is just the human journey in some ways, you know, or, or life's journey that things go, you know, we experience all the things and yet here we are alive with whatever it is we might be experiencing. Oh, so I'd love to finish. Um, I'm starting to finish on this question when I remember it. What's your vision? What do you see? What would you love to see unfolding? within whatever time frame you see or feel what's your vision for either your particular sphere or the larger sphere mm. my vision in terms of mm, what feels like the most authentic self arising service in my life and like the purpose and the, the desire that's unfolding is for for an experience of a world that has more inherent availability for relationship you know I just my desire is to walk down the street and to be able to look at a stranger and to feel their openness and to feel that they're plugged into something beyond the small self yeah and yeah I just it's it's not really like how things look it's how they feel yeah yeah it's something that yeah I'm interested in cultivating and that I'm yeah. interested in cultivating and it's that power in yeah it's that power in. I am interested in power I actually have Pluto on my south node in Scorpio I fucking love power and it has tripped me up and it has smacked me down and I have gone way off track and learned some very hard lessons and at the same time, just that that power in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my wish is for every being on earth to be oriented to that because from that place, I think things would look very different. 
Oh, let's just really feel into that where every being on earth is orientated to power within and can feel themselves as a part of something larger and the interbeingness of that. Mm. Hmm. How's that feel for you, Lara? It feels yum. It feels my spine feels really strong. I feel really grounded. Mm. And I can feel a ton of ideas emerging from that central channel. <laughs> <laughs> creativity it's like oh, this idea that idea this idea, you know yeah mm. yeah epic hey thank you so much for just coming and sharing your presence and your essence and your vibrancy with us such a delight to have you on the show mm. thank you for having me yeah good chat yeah um Alrighty, folks. So that was Lara Charlotte talking plants, planets, and prayer. Ah, what do I want to reflect on here? I really loved and going to be feeling more deeply into this idea of technology and how it affects the collective and technology to work with the energetic body, the psyche. Um, and I really, really loved the vision at the end and the way that Lara said it's not about what it looks like it's not about the form per se what it's about when we're envisioning the world we want to live into it's about how does it feel and I love that I love the way she was just like yeah everyone's orientated to power within and we're interrelational beings Ah, so epic to talk to people with a multi-dimensional experience of reality and if you're watching this podcast for a while, you'll notice that I'm one of the things I'm doing is choosing a diverse range of people with diverse world views. And if you watch all the different episodes, what I invite you to do is to really notice or sense like the, the felt sense of how people show up, the way in which they are embodied, where do they speak from, what is the transmission that you receive from them. Um, mm. all right as always thank you so much for watching or for listening my name of course is Carolia do all those things you know like follow share um, rate it on Spotify I see someone has someone's given us a five-star rating thank you so much for that that just made my heart light up when I saw that um, yeah and just sending you all so many blessings on this journey of life Thanks for listening to Conversations with Karalia and trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power and awakening. If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, karalia.com, that's K-A-R-A-L-E-A-H.com subscribe to my weekly newsletter.